so let me introduce myself because I know some of the people there because I've been uh, always looking at these uh, conversations. I'm from Argentina. I live in Buenos Aires. Uh, I a physicist by training and uh, have done research in theoretical physics for many years and now I'm trying to find out where education is going to so uh, MOOCs is something very interesting so I'm researching on that and that's uh, mainly the point why I'm uh, quite involved and trying to uh, delucidate what's going on with the MOOCs and uh, this artificial intelligence course in Stanford and things of that sort I, ha I have questions for you. I'm wondering if we should just go around quickly and reintroduce ourselves because I, I don't think everyone knows where everyone is. Uh, since I have the mic, I'll go ahead and just mention I'm Jeff. I'm in Pusan, Korea. My day job is uh, teaching teacher training at Pusan University of Foreign Studies. And uh, everything else is webcasting and managing websites and hanging out on the veranda with my wife. Oh, uh, excuse me. I'm Bernie D. Coven, and I have to leave because my grandson has just come. And uh, this was that a happy like accident. Fun. That <laughs> Bye. It was a really happy have accident. Have fun hanging out with him. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> Thanks for your time. This is wonderful. I, I, Jeff, keep me in this in this loop. I'm really excited about it. Will do. Look forward to All connecting right. again. Thanks a lot. Nice meeting everybody. Bye. Hi. Bye, Bernie. Um, I'm Allison Snikus. I'm here in uh, um, central New Jersey in the USA, and uh, I teach statistics. I think I heard on the stream that that's what Kay does, and so yes, it that's is. interesting. That's interesting to have two of us here, and there was uh, Maria was here last time with her math background. That's very interesting. Anyway, um, I teach statistics, but mostly I work with young people in just various ways outside of the school system. I do work at Wiki Educator, which I'm hoping maybe we'll talk about a collaborative, um, you know, uh, open educational resources and things like that today, because uh, that would be interesting. Um, yeah, so that's enough. Um, so I'm Kay Endress. I, I'm in Winston-Salem, North Carolina in the USA, and I teach AP Statistics. So, um, hi everyone, I'm Shahir Almira. I'm based now in Bonn, Germany, work for the United Nations University, and I'm involved in e-learning project, but also um, open education, and as I mentioned it last time, I'll be working on a project called OER Test. Um, we're trying to figure out how we can certify or get acknowledgement for um, OER-based learning and um, training, for example. And I'm um, on the lurker mood when it comes to MOOCs, but I'm very curious, so that's why I came to hang out today. All right, the floor is open. Who wants to jump in? Uh, Jeff, I sent you several mails, and um, since uh, this uh, edu MOOC, which uh, gathers us here today, uh, is ending next week, uh, there are uh, two topics which perhaps we could uh, also there was um, I think uh, JL wanted to do another topic but let me just throw one to the uh, to the group it's about the dropout uh, rate and the role of facilitators um, I had experience with uh, CCK08 and then I did a Moby MOOC uh, which was very successful uh, I don't know if you know Inge the one <coughs> the word organized it about uh, mobile learning and uh, this one is really the extreme where there are no facilitators. So there's uh, really um, the first proposal of a MOOC where you just leave it as a, a, a boat to, to uh, go on its own and to see what happens. And I've been looking uh, quite, uh, with quite a lot of rigor at how many people are working, how many people are, not, are doing things, etc. cetera. And um, there's actually something like 200 people now uh, who are who come to the Thursdays, uh, which is uh, where you have a lot of people coming in to the, uh, to the webpage, uh, something around 200 people coming in to see the, uh, the Thursday meetings. And uh, then on average, every week, we have something like 100 people per day uh, mooking, let's say, in this MOOC that started with 2,000. So the question is, um, and uh, it, it, doesn't, it didn't happen so uh, dramatically in other MOOCs, where you had facilitators uh, doing some activity 
like I, either the daily or either um, Inge was always, uh, you know, throwing ideas and pushing th people together uh, to organize the groups, etc. So uh, I don't know what people think about this. Uh, if you have experience with other MOOCs or if you if, if, if you have some thoughts on this, because I'm really interested and curious to, to understand uh, if it really has any sense to, to just uh, leave a, you know, leave a boat, you know, drifting on its own and just having a gathering of eight people, ten people here and there, uh, suddenly someone sends something interesting uh, to the uh, emails and then there is a burst of eight people. And that's, that's the most you can gather. The rest are just dropped out or not there or are lurking. There's 200 people lurking all the time. Uh, I know that because I'm looking at uh, how much response there are to emails. Sorry, okay, <laughs> too long. Not at all. I'm surprised there are, there are 200 people who watched the Thursday presentations live. Yes, more than that even. Yeah, not uh, yeah, yeah. That uh, you know, that's higher than I expected because yes, you know we're down to a few emails a day in the Google group and a few blogs a week. Uh, so I'm I'm surprised there's that many lives. That's the uh, number that uh, Google Analytics say that uh, look at the web page at that time of the day. Of the, so the, they, people go through. You see, there is one entrance to this EduMOOC, which is the web page uh, on Google. And Google Analytics, um, I'm looking at that, and there I see that people come in and then they perhaps they drop, they come, look, and just go out. But but on a whole, during that period, you have. Uh, around uh, 60 to 80 new visitors and you have 120 old visitors so people that are, are, are really uh, some kind of base that are always there there's 120 people uh, like us most probably actually uh, if you look at the emails there's um, only 10 people that have posted more than 40 uh, contributions during the eight the seven the six weeks or seven weeks that we we've done today. The rest of the people are lurking. There are 200 people there, but uh, they, they don't contribute. They just see what, what's going on. That's Google Analytics, uh, which I think it's quite precise on this. So the question is, mm -hmm. uh, should there be facilitators? And the, the other extreme, uh, we have this um, uh, artificial intelligence course on Stanford, which will be the totally the, the other extreme. Uh, a really kind of a, uh, like a face-to-face -face course where people will just uh, log in and uh, by some surely intelligent and, and interesting uh, gadgets they will um, they will see how people are doing etc they have something like 12,000 people uh, trying to see if uh, you know that said they manifested interest I think now that uh, people that know statistics know that nobody can handle that course if you're not an expert beforehand on algebra and probability. Uh, people, I think, think that it's a MOOC and they will come like in our conversations and speak about education, And uh, but this is a very serious course. But it's very interesting because it's the other extreme. There's going to be, from what I think, I haven't seen yet the details and I'm going to look into it again to research it. Uh, uh, what's going to happen there is the other extreme. There will be a facilitator that's going to really put a structure to the, to the uh, and then it might be interesting to see how many people hang hang out at the, you know stay until the end and come back coming back to the drop uh, the drop out rate. What do people think? What is the right amount mm -hmm. of facilitation? I wonder. I wonder if it um, if it matters either way. If you know, I've had some experience with workshops that we've done with Wiki Educator, and we would have a huge number of people signing up. Sometimes, you know, sometimes maybe a hundred or so, but sometimes you know, well over five hundred. And yet, by the end of the workshop, which might be a week or so, and there's daily assignments, things that you should be working on every day, and it's very tightly facilitated. There's lots of places for discussion and things. And by the end of the week, really, you have five or six people. Who are really working hard, and we have very we have specific facilitators who are going out and making personal connections with each of the people. And but if they don't come to see their connection, they you know they've already dropped out basically. And so um, we're really holding hands, but yet still only get the five or six people. I wonder if it's just that's the way we we should be okay with that because you know they got something out of it for the time that they worked there, and then. If they could make the time for it, they know what it's about, and they'll be back if it works for them. And they won't be back if it doesn't. I, yeah, I but it's, it's kind of um, a waste of resources, right? Because on the one hand, you set up 
if you set up a strategy to handle 2,000 people and uh, you have the facilitators and then suddenly you end up with five, um, that, that, that's, and, and then you call this massive, uh, that this is what I'm, I'm, I'm heading into, you know, if really these are not courses offered and in the end, instead of massive, you end up with uh, just a group of people who are interested in doing, mm -hmm. the, doing the activity. In the end, it well, doesn't the, matter. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, these weren't, you know, these weren't, you know, massive sort of things. They're just like workshops that people can sign up to all over the world. The, most of the ones that um, I'm familiar with uh, are um, wiki training workshops. So it's training in how to use a wiki that Wiki Educator provides looking to help people get the technical skills so they could uh, put their resources on Wiki Educator. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm just saying from a different perspective, not from a MOOC, but from a place with very tight facilitation, we still have that same sort of dropout. I think I kind of agree with you in that um, it's it's really about the utility for the student. I mean, if this is going to be voluntary, then people are going to come and participate as much as they need to in order to get some benefit. Or if they don't participate at all, then you know, then they might have decided it wasn't beneficial. Um, and that can happen with or without facilitation, in my opinion. Um, but I, I, speaking from my own perspective, I'm so busy these days that I'm very, very sensitive to people wasting my time. And if I if I join something and I feel like it's not beneficial or it's not efficiently using my time, then then I'm going to go someplace else. Um, so sometimes, I guess one could say that a fa facilitator might actually increase that efficiency, but only if the facilitator is providing exactly what each and every participant wants and needs. And those wants and needs may be very vastly different across different folks. And I'm not sure that there's any more to that thought, but that's that's what I've got so far. So are you suggesting that um, there should be more facilitators? Because um, what I get is that it's important to have a facilitator that could um, help get the people their needs. And since these are so various, maybe think of more facilitators, but then again, the question, I think that's your initial initial question, um, how how much facilitation can one afford in this kind of um, courses? Yeah, I'm thinking if you, if you have one facilitator, they might not be providing what everybody needs. And I don't know if I see it as, as a matter of more facilitators as and, and I'm a really chaos-friendly kind of guy, but somehow a little bit more structure. Like, I, I, I do kind of, as we head toward the home stretch of the Edumook, have a feeling of, oh, it was, you know, you know for me, I cluster around this, this webcasting stuff, and I made my site, but I feel like it never quite hit any kind of critical mass or, or gained any kind of momentum that it, or it didn't hit its potential in, in some sense. And, I mean, the question is, what kind of facilitation? How? What kind of facilitation would, would make it meaningful for people? And uh, a couple thoughts occur. One is just kind of focusing the conversation a little bit as, as people cluster, because study groups formed. But like I never heard what was going on, and I guess it's up to me as a MOOC student to go and, and find that information. But I think something like the, the Grasshopper <laughs> Daily helps do that. I also wonder about like most MOOCs that I think of were, are just totally, oh, hey, Rob, you, you still have your perfect, perfect attendance award. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, like I remember Alex course, Alec Koros, and it was kind of pre-MOOC, but it was in a way it was the first MOOC, and it was connected to an actual course at a university where there were actual students who were required to do stuff. And that provided a certain, not only structure, but a certain energy. There were assignments like there would be in a normal course, and there was output like there would be in a normal course. And so lurkers had something to, to latch on to a little bit, and it just opened up an existing course. So those are the thoughts that occur to me. 
So, Rob, we're talking about uh, uh, facilitation, how much to facilitate, uh, and, you know. The structure. Yes. I wonder if you have something there, Jeff, because I'll say I'm a lurker. You know, I've lurked. Well, I was away in the beginning, and then I tried to get up to speed, and I was sort of trying to pay attention because I thought maybe I'd get going here in the second half. And really, I've latched on here. This is sort of, you know, okay, I've, I've, this is my second time here. And there's some structure here. Sure. So, just, just saying. As unstructured as Jeff is, there is some structure here. <laughs> right, yeah. It's a page. You could show up. You do something, you know. It's, yeah. I'm trying to look um, a bit on this uh, research I'm doing. Hello? Yeah. We hear you. Okay. In this research I'm doing, I'm, I'm actually trying to see uh, how much this idea of MOOC or the idea of having these courses kind of open to everybody um, could the following. We have in Argentina, they, they are giving away laptops uh, to every kid in the school. It's kind of a one laptop per child, but it's an evolution on that. Now there are these Intel, very nice uh, computers that uh, it's a second step on that. Uh, the problem is that the teachers never touch the computer. So you can imagine then that uh, that's going to be a total failure or the kids are going to overrun the teachers. So one of my main interests and uh, some of the work I've done is uh, how to train these uh, teachers. And um, then we set up some labs, a couple of labs actually within the university but within a very poor neighborhood in, inside a school where we, uh, we create an atmosphere for the teachers to try to become uh, experts in uh, anything, in just sending mail, or just doing uh, YouTube or whatever. They, haven't, they never sent an email. So you can imagine that they come to a class where all the kids um, have all these computers and they have to teach there. So uh, my idea is that a MOOC, the MOOC idea, that's why I'm enthusiastic on that. It's interesting just to open a course that anybody can jump in at any time. There's always something going on. So people don't need to be there all the time, but all the time there's someone talking about a subject that will, you know, give them some structure, some idea, some work, some something. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I think the MOOC idea is a, it's a very nice application in that context. Um, Okay, this we're setting it up, and we're going to do it in, I think, next month. But this is going to start. So in the meantime, I'm trying to see if a very structured course like the artificial intelligence from Stanford or EduMOOC, which is the other extreme, just a boat on its own, <laughs> uh, just floating around and seeing who who gets together and whatever. So what's the best strategy? Where where do you get response from the people? In this sense, that's my interest. Okay, so I I I I, I could have. I don't know if you saw that there is a, a girl that actually was here um, uh, last week. Uh, it's called Rebecca. Then there's another guy called Apostolos. And, and these people we've been working from MobiMook actually wrote a paper together <laughs> about MobiMook. It was accepted in iRold, this uh, magazine, international review of uh, whatever. And uh, we, we, haven't, we haven't met. You know, we we just collaborated in the MobiMook. Uh, someone started writing the paper, and seven people from five, four different countries. Uh, four different languages. Uh, we, we came out with a paper that was accepted uh, a few weeks ago. It's been presented in M Learning. So uh, I found the idea very interesting, and these people were also in Edumo. We could have made uh, some strategies to, to catch a people. Actually, if you see, every time Rebecca sends an email, there is some discussion. I sent uh, a few provocative things, but it seems I'm researching. I actually prefer to leave the, the course on its own to see really what happens where there is no facilitating. Because if I start to intervene, then it's like a Schrodinger's uh, experiment where you open the, you know, you, you put, you shine light into the uh, fridge to see if there's something inside and then you modify the experiment. So uh, my way of looking at this, if, if it's a success or not, I, I actually don't care. I want to see what happens in this extreme and I will look at what happens with artificial intelligence in Stanford. What, what school were you talking about earlier? Did you say LA Unified? I beg your pardon? At the beginning of what you talked about, you said you talked about this laptop program. What school district? Uh, I, oh no, this is not. A, I work in Argentina, Buenos Aires. Oh. Okay. Uh, here, we, here we have some what you, what you would call shanty towns. We call it Villa Miserias, and uh, actually, education in Argentina compared to other Latin American countries is fantastic. Uh, although the fantastic has come from fantastic to uh, to bad. 
but still there is reminiscence of that old fantastic. So within even these Villa Miserias, people get good schooling. By good means they come to the school, they are attended there, the teachers are good, but these people are now provided with computers. And these teachers have never have never touched a computer. So it's within these neighborhoods that within these schools, which are state owned schools, that we're doing these experiments trying to to get the teachers to become familiar with all these technologies. Thanks. So I have, I have a question for you. So what's the content of the MOOC? So what? Why are people going to come to it? Uh, you mean that? you mean uh, to the to the teachers? Yeah. So because I think what you're you're suggesting is that you're going to have a MOOC. Oh. That yeah. bring teachers in. Yeah, uh, my idea, but but, but we'll yeah. see how we'll, we will put it is to have a structure. So uh, there will be there will be activities, and of course through the Ministry of Education, what we're going to do is uh, to put a prize. Teachers that do this and take the exams uh, will of course get a free internet in their homes, so they can go back home and still continue with the uh, MOOC idea and working. Okay, there's a. A plans and uh, it, it, it has to have a political uh, uh, how you say uh, uh, it, it needs to be within uh, s someone backing up you I mean it's not just a researcher that tries to to see what goes on here there is some uh, some need from the Ministry of Education to say yes we're going to try this so the idea is uh, to, to give it a structure people would come in there would be someone showing activities and engaging these people in these activities very simple idea very simple activities it's not uh, uh, trying to feel to see if tumble r is the best for putting your blog in your in your uh, mobile phone or whatever it's just to say okay let's try now how to do emails how to edit videos how to do very basic things that perhaps in the US and in other countries is second nature uh, here they haven't done it Okay, so the content is the technological tools sure, that sure. That's, teachers, that's, that's, that's the content. That, yeah. That's the content, that's the content, yes. How to educate them in, in ICT, basically. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, uh, from my work and just working with, um, you know, how to, how to edit a wiki, um, what I've seen is people come in in very different, they're in very different places, and so... Um, personalizing it to the extent you could personalize a ma something massive, I'm not so sure, but you know, to the extent that you could create ways of personalization so that the person feels like they're in the right place. This this feels right for me. Like if they're an absolute beginner, never touched anything, but yet you wouldn't want to give the, an activity on you know how to send emails to like I'm, you're you're a teacher in Argentina, so like obviously you're pretty proficient, like because here you are, like so. You know, so I think there's going to be different people have different skills, and there's certainly been uh, people from teachers from um, Argentina who have participated in some of the wiki stuff I've done, and um, they're very proficient in technology. So I think there's going to be like all different levels. Sure, sure. We'll have to divide people in different levels, most probably. Yes, you're right. Hello, Sanford. Hey, Sanford. How are you doing? Um, just to comment a little bit about this structure question, because I've been mulling this over as well. Um, you know, I think part of it is the difference between synchronous and asynchronous tools that people feel comfortable with. And I also wonder if, you know, it's a generational thing, um, because I certainly appreciate, I, I've, I've made all of the face-to-face, -face, quote, meetings, um, that Jeff's had, and I've also attended most of the panel discussions on Thursdays, because I really like that interaction that occurs at that time much more than, you know, the Google groups or the Google thing. Not that I, I'm not reading it, but I just don't react quite as well, and I'm, I'm wondering if that's partly my age. Um, another thought I had was, you know, there's a lot about gaming out there, and so, um, Osvaldo, I might suggest that you, you Google the term 23 things, which, okay. is, which, which adds a little fun to the whole direction of a MOOC or anything else you're doing, or it also adds some fun to a direction for teachers. So the, the concept of 23 things originated in the library world, and these were 23 Web 2.0 things, and this uh, library system on the east coast of the United States, I forget who what their name is right now, but basically they started this with their library staff and they said, okay, if you complete all these things, we'll put your name in a drawing at the end and you'll win a, I don't know, at that time, 
I don't know, it's a flash drive or whatever, but it, it added a bit of, of gaming to it. And sure. I think that's another piece of the MOOC that's missing, right? There, there's, you know, this part to me is fun. I guess the question is, you know, for some people I suppose fun is reading the Google responses and responding that way. But it would be fun to have some gaming pieces in here, you know, at some level as well. And that's what 23 things could do for something like this or for anybody trying to get teachers to do stuff without saying you have to do it. Okay, thank you. What I find uh, a comment on what you're saying is this edu, this edu MOOC is particularly what you say. I mean, I didn't enjoy any of the Thursday meetings. There is no interaction. There's no way. In, in, in others, I, I really interacted with the panel. I could really uh, force them to ask, you know, interesting questions, take them out. This is like seeing a video with less quality. Is I mean, there any back channel during these? Is there any place that people who are watching can chat with each other? Yeah, by like Twitter, I think. It's, Twitter. Uh, but Twitter. Twitter. But it's very, you know, suddenly if the uh, the guy that organizes sees something interesting, he would come bring it up to the table. But it, it's not interaction. This is beautiful what we're doing today. This is really interacting. And um, we, we have the same in my book. <laughs> oh, I think we could argue about that one, but I'll, I'll let that one go. <laughs> this isn't beautiful? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he likes this better than Twitter because you can't see people on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter drives me crazy for conversations. I mean, tw I love Twitter for some things, but as a back channel, you just get so much of the, yeah, I agree. <laughs> There's so, it's so hard to find the context sometimes. It's so much work to, you know, and even a normal chat room can be challenging to follow. For me, Twitter is just more work than it's worth. I, I agree on the Twitter. I don't actually have a Twitter account, so I would have had to get that all set up and going in order to participate. <laughs> but um, <laughs> right, I but um, and just looking at it, there's all the repetition also, and I understand why you re re you know repeat things. But you know, I, I'm like I read that already, or, or, or you know, like and you have to like look through all the repetition. I I don't like it as a chat to go with a, a you know even a streaming thing where you don't have really any direct interaction. And speaking of the back channel, we do have a couple comments in our back channel. And for anyone who's in the Hangout who's not there, I'll put the link in our Hangout to, to get you there. But from Norman, or N. Norman, uh, mentions, uh, I found the existing structure of the course confusing. The live sessions did provide structure that was needed for me. Matt mentions, greetings from Washington, USA. Uh, interesting discussion. No, uh, anyway, uh, just a question. Anyone in the gang get lots of asynchronous discussion? I'm sorry, get lots out of asynchronous discussions, and if so, what? So do people get something out of the Google group discussions or the Moodle discussions or whatever? Let me put one more point uh, with respect to the artificial intelligence in Stanford course, which I'm uh, very optimistic and interested in. Um, you see, this is the, for the first time I can attend I was lucky in my life. I, I lived in many countries and I, I did physics, theoretical physics, and of course I moved around and I've been in many of these universities, but not everybody has that chance. So now, let's say, someone in a good university or intermediate university in Buenos Aires wants to have a good course in uh, artificial intelligence. It's just gathering the students and then we'll see one of the best, if actually not the best teachers in the world, uh, just uh, giving, a, giving a, a, a conference for you or giving a class for you. So from people from the third world, um, this is fantastic. It's like, uh, I don't know, if, if I had classes in physics from Newton, if he was a good teacher, uh, I would really enjoy it very much. And now I'm seeing these people in Stanford showing me what they do in Stanford, putting the level, the, the, the standard of Stanford, and I can compare that to what we are doing locally. So this is uh, very, very good. Now the question is, and that this we've been discussing this week, is this a MOOC or not? It's going to be, from my perspective, very structured. I don't think you can do otherwise in very technical um, uh, courses, but this is, uh, again, it's open and we'll see what how it develops. Welcome back to Bernie, and I just want to check in with Stanford or Shahira. We haven't heard much from you guys so far. Anything on this topic or something else you wanted to bring up? 
Well, I mean, on uh, what I've gotten out of it, I've gotten a lot of personal connections, I think. Um, in the Google groups, I found you and um, Rebecca and and Rob, just as people who I found were, were interesting and could then, you know, follow, connect, uh, listen to your ideas because you know it it, it gives me something because I don't I'm locked in a room all by myself this summer. <laughs> uh, they're redoing our office, so I, I have nobody. No to decorations talk. or anything. <laughs> yeah, it, it was an old. Uh, they're they're going to take it out, gut it, and turn it into an IT room. So I, I'm just in this empty room that you know I haven't had anybody to talk to. So I've gained you know connections outside of my school and I think that you know in itself is a, a benefit you know that I wasn't really knowing what to expect from the discussions of the learning so I, I've kind of stopped um, replying to stuff but I still read it all I, I read the Google groups every morning as part of my you know daily thing when I check in even when I was on vacation I still you know opened my mail to read that just to see what was happening and um, the finding learning about the gaming and part of a game is game of sensation I thought it was a, an interesting topic to, to it got me thinking about how I'm going to build that and, and try to get other faculty to use it and their online courses so I, I, I've gained a thing that I'm not sure how I'm going to use yet but at least um, I'm hoping to well you see Jeff this is exactly what I was saying Google Analytics is correct there's a lot of people hanging out there looking, you know, and uh, enjoying, and uh, this is what my Google Analytics is telling me. It's uh, 200, 300 people every day going to the main page and seeing what's going on. Well, so, I'm a fan uh, of Google Analytics. How do you have access to that information? Uh, this is with Ray. We, we are working together, you know, the, the organizer. Uh, so I asked him if I could uh, have access. And I'm curious, not just the page views, how many unique visitors are you getting? On unique that? visitors up to now, there's been uh, 10,000 people. But on that on okay. that day, on those Thursdays, are on you getting two hundred uniques? Uh, two, yeah, of the four hundred, of the three hundred, well, depending on which week. I can give you <laughs> wait a second because I'm writing up on this. Um, before you just tell us, or can you explain Google Analytics, or could somebody explain that to us before you tell us that's other stuff, or vice versa? Okay, it's it's very simple. It's uh, every time you go to the the, the web page of uh, EduMOOC. Uh, you get a little uh, something on your computer because it used to be that they would analyze your IP address but since many institutions have one IP address in front and then they do what's not network address translation you would get a hundred people with the same IP, IP so they don't do that anymore they just <laughs> put something on your uh, on your browser which you don't know it's a kind of cookie and then every time you come back to the web to the page it tells if you are first timer or you've been here before and then it, you can do all this a study of how many times how much time you spend on the on the web page every day every hour so you can make an analysis this is actually for marketing and selling stuff or whatever but here it's uh, used in another sense so you can I, I can tell you exactly let's say yesterday how many people visited how many people were new how many people uh, what's the average time you spent there how many pages they looked in which is two uh, not more than two on average. They spend something like two minutes, uh, and and you get something like 400. Let's say two we uh, one week ago, you would get 400 people or 300 people per day, of which uh, 60 were new and uh, 160 were uh, old. Uh, people just came back. Can can this be used for any web page or just web pages built in Google? Any any web page. You just have to add a little. I mean, you have to study it a little bit. But you go and you, you take a little piece of, uh, uh, of programming, you add it to your web page, and then your page can be, it doesn't have to be in Google, your web page can be analyzed by uh, Google Analytics. And I'll just cool, show thanks. you quickly, these are some Google Analytics that okay. uh, are from one of my Korean sites. And so it gives you information on exactly how many visits, how many page views, how many pages per visit. Uh, you can scale at any time frame you want, be it a month, a day, an hour. Uh, it breaks it down by browser, by time on site. So it's it's a really nice set of uh, free analytics that are available. Okay, Jeff, you got to tell me how did you get it to show your yeah. desktop? Magic. <laughs> 
I second that question. What camera were you using? I have Minicam running on my site. Oh, let me switch back to that so I can show you. So uh, Minicam is the program I have running that lets me stream. And so what this program does, I set a certain portion of my desktop and I say, all right, capture this part of my desktop and stream that to live stream. And so that's what people who are watching this are seeing is that portion of my screen that Minicam is doing it. I can okay. also set my Hangout. Like right now in my Hangout, you're seeing the Hangout. <laughs> yes. Uh, and the reason you're not seeing me is because you don't see yourself in a Hangout. Oh, and my webcam's not on. Uh, so uh, in my Hangout settings, I just go to Settings and select many cam as my virtual cam instead of my webcam. And then when I switch my webcam, you go back to, to me. If I want to do part of my screen, I just choose many cam. So is many cam free? Is it? Um, yes. Oh, I'll have to look this up. I and like I have a whole cool. guide on how I stream and record these things. I will put that link in both text chats now. That's manycam.com, right? Yes. Okay, uh, put it, just put it in, share it in the, the other chat so everyone can have a look at it. Just put it in, share it in the other chat so everyone can have a look at it. There you go. Okay. So, Jeff, do you have one or two cameras? One. Okay. Three monitors, but just one camera. Right, okay. <laughs> So, Allison, I was curious about Wiki Educator. You know, I, I've I've seen it. I, I don't know that much about how it works. Uh, I'm curious if you have some of the same issues as Wikipedia is having these days. Can you give us a, a thumbnail sketch of, of how that works and if it's connected to mookie mookiness in any way? Um, yeah, I'm not really too good on what mookiness is. So, but I could give you a little update on who, who is. And well, we'll tweet. We'll tweet it to you. <laughs> 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 so Wiki Educator is, um, is, is a model that uses the Wikimedia software, it's modeled off of Wikipedia, and the idea is to have a place for collaborative educational work um, that has an open license, so it's, um, uh, it's licensed uh, Creative Commons by SA, so attribution and share alike. And so for instance, Osvaldo said he did a, um, he did a collaborative paper with two other people that he met on MobyMook, and they could have done that openly in Wiki Educator. So they could have, you know, found a little spot, gave it a little name, and done all of their work on that paper there. And it'll publish to PDF. You can collect things together into books. You can um, map the pages you create over into like a Moodle page. I, I do that pretty often. Um, so, so, uh, so I have. Um, I use it for sort of two kinds of things, for personal um, keeping track of what I'm going to be, um, the, sort of my notes for, they're not exactly lectures, but the notes that I use for teaching statistics, I would have that sort of under my user account page as sub pages. Um, and then I, but I also create resources that I use directly with the students. So, um, so maybe an activity page that I would use with them or some sort of a helpful resource because I think their textbook isn't written really the best for who they are and they could use it written a little differently or whatever. So I'll make a little page on that and share that with them. Um, and I think the idea is that as teachers, um, so, so those two purposes, I don't end up collaborating all that much because there really isn't a a base of users yet, so there really aren't any other people who use it for statistics. There's maybe there's one person I've noticed recently. Um, he's from uh, Guyana, and so maybe, but I, I have a feeling we don't really match up all that well in the kinds of statistics we teach. So that, but Kay and I would probably match up pretty well. I do intro stats, which is close to AP stats, yeah. so you know we would probably match up pretty well. Um, oh. Anyway, so, you know, and, and I think it's a way for us, you know, so, to collaborate. I often go to a website and see a resource and I say, well, that's just about right what I need, but it's not quite right. 
So if I could take that page and adapt it a little bit to my needs, then I could have exactly what I want. But that's the idea behind this. So we have a page maybe on, I don't know, statistical, you know, introduction to statistical inference. And I create it for my needs, and then maybe somebody else comes along and they can copy that page as a subpage or naming it somehow. We don't need to worry about that. And then they have that resource is particular to their needs. Still a lot of the same content, a lot of the same definitions, but maybe the examples are slightly different or whatever. Um, and, and so that's the idea that we would have lots of pages that are suitable for that topic but have a slightly different setting or context that is particular to the learners that that particular teacher works with. Um, and so that's the idea behind it. Um, I have a couple follow-up questions, but I also sure. want to say hello to Lisa, who, who has joined us for a while. Hello, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hello. How's it going? Hi. You, you've been tuning in for a while. Were there any comments or questions you were eager to uh, chime in with? Oh, no, I was just uh, thinking about the, um, the what is a MOOC discussion and wondered if I missed it because I was so late. Yeah, we got it all sorted out. We know what a MOOC is now. <laughs> just ask <laughs> Lisa, you know. Lisa, did you tune in because how did you get notified about this? What caused you to join us? You know, if I remembered the trail, I'd tell you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I go, I, okay. I, I get so many just, Go ahead. Uh-oh, she froze. <laughs> I, I was just reflecting on our conversation earlier about... Um, so many places, but I got back to me. I, I think the tubes got clogged there, Lisa. Your, your video froze and your audio got all crunched down, so we lost your last couple of sentences. I'm sorry, my computer is slowing everything down. I've never done a hangout before. No, that's fine now. Perhaps, Jeff, uh, you could resume a little bit on the uh, artificial intelligence Stanford because Lisa was very active on that uh, after uh, Siemens, George Siemens put up his uh, I want to do that course and I would like to hear from her what she thinks and perhaps interchange some ideas. Yeah, I think I think my perspective was a little bit hardline on the whole MOOC thing and that I, I do think that Stanford uh, Stanford's course qualifies. I. I don't think it's because they're Stanford, and I don't think that the uh, textbook cost, which was one of the things that people were talking about, has has anything to do with whether or not it's a MOOC. Um, my my concern was just if it's massive and it's open and it's online and it's a course, uh, then it's a MOOC. And I, I don't know whether that that perspective is. Uh, it's interesting that there's uh, a lot of discussion about it. Uh, to me, it seems fairly clear cut, but I understand that there are people who think it has to be connectivist to be a MOOC, or it has to be um, free to be a MOOC, or or a whole bunch of other qualifications that that I just don't think are there. So that was my perspective. Pretty pretty straightforward. My my concern was not so much on the book, and I think that's that's fine that there is a book. It doesn't matter. There are alternatives, and most probably these people will put some of them uh, for people in poor countries or people that don't have the book. Uh, my question is, and I don't know how it's going to happen, and this is the problem, I have to wait until they do it, is if there is going to be any interaction between the students. If so, then it's a MOOC, and for me it's fine, it's a very structured MOOC, but it's fine for me. If there is no interaction between the students, that is, if only there is a, in the Cormier Siemens perspective. Yeah, and, and my concern was that the interaction between the students sort of modeling it off of the ideas of the early MOOC could happen on its own, that students could hook up uh, between themselves if they, if they wanted to, and that I don't think that the uh, student interaction has to be an integral part of the course as long as the course is open. If the course is open, then everybody can access everything and everybody can find each other. So I wasn't as concerned about that, but I, I understand that that's considered to be a a basic part of, of a MOOC because that keeps the M part together, that keeps massive together. But I, I think that the massiveness can be created by the students rather than the course. 
Sure, but you can have a course where people don't see each other. I mean, you, you, if you don't have access to the Google list or to the emails or somehow, how do I know who's, who's looking at the course? I don't know who the 20,000 students uh, up to today, who they are, or who. Um, but in, in this EduMOOC, I did know beforehand right. who were the people in the, Moodle li in the Google list. So if, I, if that is open, then fantastic. I agree with you totally. And, and it's going to be a, if, a very if the students course. there are not able to hook up, then it's a bad MOOC. It's a really bad MOOC, but it's still a MOOC. <laughs> See, I okay. don't feel especially attached to the word MOOC. I feel like, you know, there's a, a spectrum of learning that's online and that's open, and some of it's more open, and some of it's more online, and some of it's more massive. But all of this is happening, and. I, I don't know why it's that important to say this is this is a MOOC, this isn't a MOOC. I see it all happening on a spectrum of openness and onlineness. I think the reason I'm kind of hung up on the term is because in CCK08, when the the word was being invented, when the term was being invented, there was a whole lot of discussion about about what it was, whether that was the right term and fitting into it. And I'm really kind of fascinated with all sorts of learning models. Of course, most of the course itself spent is still spending so much time talking about what is connectivism and is this connectivist, is this not connectivist, that I find models just in general very interesting to see whether things fit into it and the whole discussion that comes up around them is just fascinating to me. Lisa, might you say what you study or what you do? Um, because we, we introduced ourselves. Okay, you don't know what we perhaps you were there looking, but uh, what kind of work do you do? I'm a history instructor at a community college in Southern California, and I also direct a volunteer project among our faculty called the Program for Online Teaching. And our MOOC is, starts on September 1st, except it's not really a MOOC because it's not massive. <laughs> well, we could help make it massive if you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I keep thinking about that. <laughs> So, Lisa, I'd love to talk to you more. I live in uh, Central California, and I um, I just retired from a school district where I was principal of an online charter school, and I'm now working with school districts and colleges and different groups to move online learning forward, um, especially in the state of California. So it might be fun. I'll, I'll talk to you later. It sounds interesting what you're going to do. That'd be great. What school are you at? I'm at Maricosta College in Oceanside. Oh, okay. Great area. <laughs> I'd be interested to talk some more about, um, like, online collaborative, you know, work to create educational resources, sort of like what Wiki Educator does, but um, I don't know, people's experiences maybe, or what, what are the struggles, what's the struggles with uh, Wikipedia currently, and things like that. And I'd be interested in hearing more how is, is Wiki Educator working? You know, we had a bunch of discussions back in 2006 or 7 about Wiki textbooks. And, you know, I mean, the one thing that just drives me nuts about education everywhere is the cost of textbooks. It just seems to me that I, I just don't get it why <laughs> they're so expensive. And, you know, there's a number of efforts these days to create uh, collaborative, open textbook kind of material. Um, I don't know if Wiki Educator does that kind of stuff, but it seems like so many people uh, are generating so much instructional content that if we find ways to put everyone on the same page and, and basically what Wiki Educator is trying to do, that it's just it's going to serve a lot of needs and help a lot of budgets be met. Well, I, I completely agree. Um, I, I think that's the. And I'm, I'm sorry. Idea. I'm sorry to interject with nagging. I just want to mention to people, we do get typing noises a lot in the audio. So if you want to type, and Lisa and Sanford, I'm talking to you, because <laughs> you have the loudest keyboards. Feel sorry. free to oh type away. God. Feel free to interrupt. If you do want to type a lot, just mute your mic in the hangout. I, I've right. learned to do that. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> and, and I, I will do it too. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> and please unmute any time. We want to hear from you. We just don't want to hear your typing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I think that's 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 definitely my goal is to I think knowledge should be free and but also I, I think we have to think about um, 
knowledge, the way people learn, they learn best when the, the content that they're attempting to learn fits their needs, their current needs. And one textbook, even a hundred textbooks, can't cover the kind of, you know, uh, ways that, of learning that people need. And so I, I really look forward to a time when we have just so many resources online and so many choices of things to do so that, you know, teachers can can look to, well, you know, what's the best content for this learner? How can I help this learner find the things that really will help them learn something hard like statistical inference? It's hard to learn statistical inference. And there's lots of ways to present it and to think about it and activities to do. And, you know, teachers have that choice. And to be sort of locked into a particular textbook, it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not useful. So I can't wait for the day when we have sort of a lot of range of things and we can almost make our own textbook to suit the situation that you need. And, and it students won't be can hard. pursue their own path toward learning, yeah. you know, where there's, yeah. okay, here's the concept for teaching, you know, different right. media are going to ap appeal to different students. Yeah. That'll be great. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, but I think we, we're a long way from that. And, um, but I think one of the steps is to begin to share our materials online and in an open way with an open copyright license so that we can copy and paste from one person to the next person and just, you know, CC by, CC by SA, attribute where you got it from. So, for instance, online stat book written by David Lane, a pretty well-known um, um, yeah. professor at Rice University. Um, his stuff is public domain. The whole thing is public domain. I can cut and paste from there and paste it over into Wiki Educator and make whatever changes I want to make. That's really cool. And just cite him and his project as the source of the, of the content. That, that's pretty awesome. Can you, can you put the link to that guy's stuff somewhere? Sure. I, and I say that because one of my uh, contracts is working with doctoral professors in moving their courses online, and one of the guys I'm working with is a statistics professor. Um, I'll just check it first. But those statistics people are all over the place. I was just going to say, they're so everywhere. <laughs> yeah. May I use this uh, opportunity to ask a question, perhaps um, to understand uh, one of the, of the things that appear in the MOOCs? Um, if you look at the, the geography where people come from, they're mainly from the U.S. That is, educators from the U.S. participate in this and in every other MOOC I, I've looked into. And then people from Canada, which would be something like uh, one-third of the ones in the U.S. And then from the U.K. you get something like uh, a half of what you get from Canada. And then nothing from Germany, except uh, the presence here. <laughs> but perhaps the language, <laughs> the language, the language might, might, might be the, the problem there. And you get people from Australia. So my question is, apart from David Wiley, who, who is not on the MOOCs, but is in a, in a similar spirit, I don't see many people in the U.S. advocating uh, these ideas uh, related to education. Uh, um, but I see many from Canada. I see many from Australia. Uh, why, what's the reason? Why well, you get most of the participants come from the U.S. Can I venture a guess? I, I think it has something to do with copyright and U.S. copyright. Uh-oh. No, See no, what happens we'll never when you talk about copyright? That's the whole <laughs> problem. <laughs> and I was going to say copyright and lobbyist and the industry of of publishers and things like that. Well, and when, when we also say that most, all the MOOCs at this point, at least the ones I'm aware of, are from Canada and the U.S. Allison, you've got that dazed look again. I'm trying to get the right address for online stuff. Okay. <laughs> so is oh, it dot org or dot com? So I, I got it, I got it. I'm posting it. <laughs> But no, so now it didn't come out right. So And Allison, I couldn't agree with what you were saying more about copying and pasting freely and all that stuff. Really important in my mind too. And attributing. Yeah, yeah. Attributing and having easy one. having easy yeah. ways to attribute, I think it's really yeah. important. Um, you know, you could just put in a couple little things, so um, I don't have it yet, but you know, you can make a template in Wiki Educator where you just plug in a couple things and then it just formats the whole thing to look like a nice attribution. And um, 
I, I think that's awesome. useful. So we were left hanging, Lisa. We had to make up the rest of the answer. <laughs> Oh. Welcome back, Osvaldo. Oh, something happened with Google Plus in Argentina, at least. <laughs> I think it's the copyright police for in, in America. Yes. They didn't want you to hear the answer. <laughs> Some of the words we said. Here too. Oh, God. oh, are we losing Lisa again? Oh. I think I'm back. Google keeps throwing me out and then telling me there's a technical problem and I can't come back in and I have to create my own room. I've been sent to my room by Google. <laughs> 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 so do we have more time? I, I, Jeff, you had mentioned a while ago that, that, um, that there are problems with current problems with Wikipedia. I'm curious about that. Well, I just heard that the is number it? of contributors is declining and they've sort of developed um, a snobby culture of the Wikipedia elite who keep yeah. tagging articles as this is inappropriate and that's inappropriate and so it's kind of scaring people off. You know, in the beginning that whole idea of like, look, anyone can edit this page, but now yeah. the wiki police are, are getting so um, vigilant that the numbers are dropping from what I heard. I'll find that link. Well, th well, that's, in well that's interesting because, you know, it, it, it's definitely a tendency when you start in sort of on this collaborative idea, you say, well, let's have like a style guide and let's say, oh, let's say this is how we should title our pages and this is how we should do this and this is how we should do that. And um, it hasn't really caught on in Wiki Educator, which maybe is a good thing because I think the fewer rules you have, the easier it is for people to come in and do what they need to do for their purposes. And maybe that's not such a bad thing. On the other hand, it brought those of us who are like working on the MOOC page furiously in to do that. The fact that, that somebody put up the warning in the Google group discussion saying, yeah. oh no, they're marking it to take it down, uh, got us all jumping in there and fixing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, has, that certainly has a benefit. Yeah. Maybe people were neglecting stuff. Maybe it was just being put up there and then nobody would edit it for six months or a year and it would just hang there. I mean, the, the MOOC was only up for a month before it got slammed, but maybe there's others that nobody's tending to. Yeah, and I, I think there are a lot of pages on Wikipedia that are about um, um, not, not, not so easily factual. So let's say, um, okay, so I homeschooled my kids, so there, there's probably a page on unschooling. And, you know, there's really a lot of uh, disagreement about what unschooling is. And so how could you really write an encyc encyclopedia article that really characterizes what unschooling is when really none of us agree what it is? So, you know, that, I think there's quite a number of those pages that struggle. And we're doing it with the MOOC page and we all don't agree either. Yeah, well, there you go. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> Allison, could I ask you to share where you work again and what you teach? Um, so mostly, um, well, I teach uh, as a part-time lecturer at Rutgers University, the Graduate School of Education. So I do the second half of the intro stat class. So I haven't been teaching it very uh, long. I'm about to teach it the second time this, this coming time. I did a group of uh, high schoolers. I taught them intro statistics. It wasn't exactly AP stat, but um, they, were, uh, they were homeschoolers. So, um, it, but we did it online. I used the uh, Carnegie Mellon um, OLI statistics course, just spectacular for beginning yeah. learners. Really, just unbelievably spectacular. I saw so, I saw that on your wiki edu wiki um, educators page, and I thought I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. So I've been using it as the secondary. So for the statistics course for the graduate students, they are not necessarily math people. Some of them are, but some of them aren't. And the non-math people just really dread the class and they're like, oh, I don't want to do this and it's so hard. And in the past it's been taught, the other people who teach it teach it from a math perspective. I teach it from an applied perspective and downplay the math because I really think we should attend to what the person is going to do with the information. And so these people are going to be guidance counselors. So they need to learn how to, you know, understand the statistics in journal articles and in testing interpretive materials and that sort of thing. So we should be attentive to that. Um, so I've been using the, those as the uh, 
sort of secondary course materials, and the graduate students just love it. They come in and say, well, forget the textbook because of this reason or that reason. And, but I loved the description over there. That was really good. Can you just keep putting out more of those? So, so I think it had good success, and the high schoolers loved it, uh, worked with it really well. Their, I used their little course design, their, their uh, learning management system with the high schoolers, and it worked really well. And, uh, we Did we met once a week. It's twenty-five dollars to to make a course where you're going to track what they do. They pay twenty-five dollars per student to use it. Um, we have a request for that link in the chat room to the spectacular right. stats right. course. The spectacular stats course. I will go find the exact and make sure it's right. Kay, so do you teach statistics it. also? I I do I do and I know exactly <sighs> what she's talking about from Carnegie Mellon because I just you know sort of looked at it and. And I don't think it'll work for me because of the twenty-five dollar charge, but but um, but it's really neat to hear that it is as good as it looked. Because but I you can, it. they could just anybody could just use it for free. So you can use it as resources. Right. And what I've done is I've copied their quizzes, and I offer those in in our our learning management system, so that mm -hmm. they're not you know, and they just take not all of them, yeah. so I adapt it and fix it yeah. to be what I want. But you know, uh huh, so. Okay, what level of statistics do you teach? I teach high schoolers, so I teach advanced placement in high school, and which is you know pretty much equivalent to what she's talking about. Hmm. Um, so I'm really I'm really glad you were in this chat today, Allison, in this well, hangout I'll, today. No, I will. Well, you've seen the link, but I'll put the link in there so in case somebody comes yeah. along later and sees this and wants to know what we're talking about. I, yeah. I know we're a little over time, but you stat people. Have you ever had a class where you've had students from other classes interact with each other, or how would that look in a stats course, or or is it or is there any use in doing that? What do you What do you mean, Rob? Is well, math I mean, social? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. I've got these yeah, doctor level yeah. these doctor level students this fall with this stats professor that are going to take the. Uh, the beginning stats course at the doctoral level, which is not too much different than what um, Allison's teaching, from because yeah. I've taken the course in the past, and so I'm just wondering how is it social, or, or would there be any um, advantage to connecting students in similar courses across? Oh, absolutely. And yeah, how would absolutely. you do it? Why would you do it? Well, I mean, even just to let. All the students know how universal statistics is is probably worthwhile. Um, I've connected with um, a couple of educators in New Zealand, and was hoping to try to Skype with them. The problem is their academic year is very different than ours, so I'm not sure we're ever going to get it together. But um, but I think I think you're right, and I think in some ways it's actually advantageous to do it across age groups. Um, because sometimes high schoolers don't realize how important these things that they're learning really are. And if they see adults learning the same stuff at the same time, that's going to help them understand. So I don't know if that, you know, uh, so my answer to Rob's question is yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, my, mine would be yes too. It's uh, I think statistics is very social. I think you can have quite a lot of discussion about how statistics is presented um, in the media and in in our lives, culturally speaking. That you know, we we talk. One of the things we do is talk about causation, and that's just a fascinating. You know how we can go from a study that had lots of conditions and you know doesn't really apply to everything to a you know, top line news article that basically says potatoes cause you to get fat, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know. Are either of your <laughs> students producing content online? Are they blogging? Are they... Mine aren't. I, I wish they would, and maybe I'll get to the point where I could get them, find a way to create an environment where they'll be encouraged to do that. I'm, I'm trying to get there. Last year we used um, a... a uh, a tool called Edmodo, um, which for me didn't work very well because I couldn't, I, I wasn't very good at facilitating student to student discussion online. But 
I was able to post some interesting things and get their feedback and they just they just blew me out of the water and what they would come up with individually um, and so this year I'm switching to a new tool called Schoology um, and I'm hoping that with that they'll have their own blog pages and so I'm hoping to get a little bit more of that online content but even then it's not necessarily accessible to the outside world it's a, it's a protective protected um, you know course for the kids um, and and my district is very sensitive to all sorts of um, online issues so I've got to be very careful with what I do I think yeah um, I think that's a good idea to move to Schoology I think that sounds really interesting I've, I've heard wonderful things let me uh, use this socializing uh, to ask a question uh, to Chahira. I think if I pronounce right the word, the, your, your name. Um, yes, you do. I heard a bit about what you do in Bonn uh, in Jeff's uh, last, not this week, last week's, uh, uh, what you call it, Moodcast. Uh, you see, I, I, I have a lot of links with Germany, especially I, was, uh, uh, I lived in Stuttgart several years as a von Humboldt scholar. And actually, I'm quite linked uh, in, in the way of trying to start projects together, etc. Is your group open to all of this? Uh, can you tell me a little bit more of your structure in the sense of international cooperations and things of that sort, especially with the European Union? Well, well the structure is a bit complicated, but um, like we have had quarters, I think you heard this last time, um, we have had quarters in Japan, uh, but we are based here in Bonn and we have the vice rectorate in Europe. Um, we, we are an umbrella institute for other institutes, there are UNU also. Um, with regard to the cooperation um, or projects that are funded by the European Union, we are ourselves in one of these uh, projects and it's um, the one called OER Test. Um, if we are open to that, yes, of course, and depending on the entrance and, and, and the directions, we have a mandate for um, actually doing capacity development through e-learning or um, call it whatever you want. Um, uh, can be also ICT enhanced learning and um, we're very much uh, growing toward um, open content and that's why we're engaged in this project part of the consortium on open educational resources um, I don't know if this answers your question but this is the status right now yeah, yeah. I'll look at uh, a bit more and perhaps communicate with you on more private uh, more you're welcome private. I have your email anyhow so it's okay Cool. Well, it's always nice when a new connection is made and uh, lots of new connections tonight. This has been great. Yeah. Uh, I'm not especially pressed for time, but I'm thinking we should probably head toward the, uh, the home stretch here uh, since we're coming up on more than an hour. Any uh, thoughts anyone wants to get in here before we wrap up? I, I think uh, coming back to the MOOCs and uh, this new MOOC called Change, I think it's going to have a different spirit. What I like, I even it's 45 weeks, can you imagine if uh, we went from 2000 to nearly, I don't know, 100 in <laughs> Edu MOOC, in 45 weeks we will get to minus numbers, you know, minus 20. <laughs> <laughs> uh, participation, I mean, it's not going to happen because what they've done, which I think uh, that's why they're clever, is that every week they put up a different uh, topic and they put up different, not facilitators, but different uh, organizers. So each organizer, I, I think I will see in this, uh, if, if we do the study, what, what we'll see is, is speaks. Some of the weeks are going to be a lot of people, some of the weeks not, depending on how good the facilitator is. But here in Edumuk, it was just uh, one, 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 one shot and then it was left on its own. So that, that will be very interesting. I, I know people that are experts in one week from Argentina doing, uh, they're doing uh, education in the university through Facebook. So that's an experience. Many people will like that. So that week, perhaps, we'll have many people and then the next week, no. So this is going to be different, something interesting to investigate, I think. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> As always, a pleasure. Uh, and next week will be the graduation MOOCast. Uh, <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Yeah. We graduated. Pass out the diplomas. <laughs> and I'll keep this going in one form or another. I've really enjoyed the um, kind of the spontaneous nature of this, and you never know what's going to happen, but it seems like every week something interesting happens thanks to folks who show up. So uh, thanks very much, and have a great week. Thanks, Jeff. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks.
Bye-bye. 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 B